So I am very excited to have our speaker today, Megan McElfresh, to join us and talk about graft versus host disease, an overview of graft versus host disease post hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And Megan is also um, one of our planning committee members and does a lot of work behind the scenes in helping coordinate these. So Megan McElfresh is a physician assistant, graduated from Gardner-Webb University in December 2009 with her bachelor's degree in biology with a math and chemistry minor. She then worked for a year as a nursing assistant before attending physician assistant school. She graduated from Methodist University with her master's in medical science in 2013 and became a board certified PA. She has been working at UNC in the bone marrow transplant and cellular therapy program since August of 2014. She loves spending her free time hanging out with family or reading, listening to audiobooks and podcasts. So Megan, outside of your professional bio, um, anything you'd like to share with our um, audience this afternoon? Um, sure. Um, so we were just talking about um, our favorite podcast. So um, I actually really am into murder podcasts. Um, our whole group is, which I think is kind of ironic um, and a little interesting, but my favorite is Crime Junkies or Serial. That's great. So um, for those that are um, interested in crime podcasts, M Megan's your um, referral. Um, so here is a sample of poll everywhere. Um, your first sample question is graft versus host disease. It's a condition that occurs when donor, bone marrow, or stem cells attack the recipient. A true, B, false. Um, here is our disclosures for our lecture this afternoon. So, Megan, our audience is, um, oh, now we have a mix of true and false. What do you think? So the correct answer is true. Okay, so most of our audience um, got it correct. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Megan. Thank you for being here to share your expertise. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you, Tammy. Um, so again, today I'm going to be presenting just an overview of graft versus host disease post stem cell transplant. Um, these are the objectives for the talk today. So to understand graft versus host disease, you first have to understand a little bit about the basics of transplant. So there are two types of stem cell transplants, um, autotransplants or autologous and allogeneic transplants. In both of these patients receive chemotherapy or radiation um, conditioning regimens before they are given a stem cell infusion. With the auto transplants, patients receive back their own stem cells. And then with allogeneic transplants, patients receive stem cells from a living donor or donated um, umbilical cord blood. And graft-first host disease is a complication after allogeneic transplants. How does GVHD occur? So um, donor T cells or the graft um, see the patient or the host healthy cells as foreign. This then creates an immune response against the host tissue cells, and it creates a multi-organ syndromes of tissue inflammation and or fibrosis. And this is a major cause of morbidity and non-relapse mortality in patients post allogeneic stem cell transplant. So there are two types of uh, graft versus host disease. There's acute and chronic, and we will discuss both of those today. Um, so acute GVHD is typically mediated by mature T cells in the infused graft, typically occurs in the first 100 days, and typically affects the GI tract, um, skin, or liver. With chron chronic GVHD, it's mediated by the developing T cells. Um, so the recipient or the host, their thymus is unable to educate these maturing donor T cells to not react against itself. And it generally occurs past day 100. Um, and it can really affect any organ within the body. So mouth, skin, nails, hair, GI tract, lungs, liver, muscle, joints, and genitalia. One caveat to the timing of GVHD. Um, so acute GVHD typically is before 100 days, but can occur after. And chronic GVHD is typically um, after 100 days, but can occur before. So really the best way to classify these now is based on the mechanism and the physical manifestation. 
So looking into acute GVHD, um, pathophysiology for this, you can really think of it as a three-phase process where the innate and adaptive immune systems um, interact. So first there's tissue damage um, to the recipient or the host, and that's from the radiation and chemotherapy that they get pre-transplant, which then activates what's called antigen presenting cells or APCs, and these release inflammatory cytokines. And then the second phase is the afferent phase, which there's donor T cell activation and clonal expansion. So the APCs actually activate these donor T cells. And then that leads to the third phase, which is target cell apoptosis. And this is the efferent phase. So there's cellular and inflammatory factors that work together to damage the target organs. Um, this picture here kind of shows um, the three phases. So at the top, you can see that the patient receives um, conditioning, which is either chemo or radiation, which then causes the tissue damage. And then moving uh, counterclockwise, the second phase, the donor T cells are activated. So these host um, APCs are created. They activate the donor T cells. Then there's an inflammatory process um, that then leads to the target cell apoptosis, and that's the third phase. So acute GVHD um, used to be defined as classically occurring before 100 days, um, but now they look at it more as GVH is, acute GVHD is GVH that's not characteristic of chronic, um, which seems kind of self-explanatory, but there are specific diagnostic and distinctive features for chronic GVHD, and to have acute GVHD, you cannot have any of those features. And again, it typically affects the skin, GI tract, and liver. Um, the table below just kind of describes um, acute GVHD and what we can see with that. So classic is normally less than 100 days, has acute features, but not chronic. And then if it's over 100 days when we see um, features of acute, that can be considered persistent, recurrent, or late onset acute GVHD. But again, has no features of chronic GVHD. What are some of the risk factors for GVHD? Um, so the degree of the um, incompatibility between donor and recipient can be a major risk factor. Recipient or donor age, typically older age, so age greater than 40. Um, gender disparity between donor and recipient. And then the intensity of the conditioning regimen. Um, so a higher intensity regimen causes more of that tissue damage, which can lead to more uh, risk for GVHD. And then the source of the graft can also be a risk. Um, we typically see higher GVH with peripheral stem cells versus a narrow product, um, but this actually is more of a risk factor for chronic than acute GVHD. Um, so one of the most important risk factors for acute GVHD and chronic is going to be the um, degree of incompatibility between the donor and recipient, and this is based on HLA typing. So this is a human leukocyte antigen. Um, there are um, gene regions that we look at. There's three of them. Um, for transplant, the most important are the first and the second. So in the first region, there's genes that code for HLA type A, B, and C. Um, and then in the second region, um, DR, and DP, and DQ. Um, mm -hmm. With transplant, we really focus on HLA types A, B, C, and DR. Um, and then there's a third region as well. So um, human leukocyte um, or HLA typing is used to um, look at um, the match between donors and recipients for marrow or cord blood transplants. HLAs are proteins or markers that are found on most cells in your body. And then your immune system uses these markers to recognize which cells belong to your body and which do not. And this can be tested through um, a blood sample or a cheek swab. Um, and if there are people that are interested in looking at HLA typing and becoming donors, um, that's done through Be The Match. Um, with acute GVHD, so again, there's this intense inflammatory response. So donor T cells recognize major and minor HLA disparities on the host cells. And then with related donors, there's a 30 to 40% chance of acute GVHD. And with unrelated, it's a 60 to 80% chance. There is um, grading and severity scales that we use for acute GVHD. This picture here kind of goes all of, over all of that and in depth, um, but we'll break it down by organ system. Um, so the grading is done by each organ. And then the overall severity is based on if there's more than one organ site. So acute skin GVHD, um, typically we see an erythematous maculopapular rash. Um, people can have pruritus as well. 
Um, it really can affect any area of the skin. There can be severe cases that have blistering and slothing of the skin, and it can be diagnosed either clinically or by skin biopsy. So for clinical grading, grade one, there's typically a maculopapular rash that's over less than 25% of body surface area. Grade two would be a rash of over 25 to 50% body surface area. And grade three would be general erythroderma on greater than 50% body surface area with grade four being erythroderma and bullae. Um, we use the rule of nines to determine the body surface area that's covered in rash. This is just a picture of the rule of nines. Um, it's similar to what's used for um, burn victims as well. This is a picture of some mild acute GVHD. Um, so the patient has some maculopapular um, follicularly based lesions on their lower extremity. Um, the patient probably would be complaining of some itching as well. This is a little bit more severe. Um, so there's some erythematous macules on a patient's palm. Um, and then this, it's hard to see in the picture, but as a slightly higher grade GBH, there's some desquamation, um, there's some hyperpigmented areas as well. And then this is a picture of a grade four severe skin GBHD. So there's bullae and slothing of the skin. Um, with a punch biopsy is a way to actually confirm um, skin GVHD, but again, can also be graded clinically. When we do get punch biopsies on our patients, there are certain things that they're looking for, um, for pathology for that. So some of the key findings that they look for are interface dermatitis, which is vascularization of the basal layer of the epidermis and lymphocytic infiltrate in the superficial dermis. They also can see epidermal apoptotic keratinocytes. Um, they can see lymphocyte migration into the epidermis, as well as the presence of satellite cell necrosis. You can grade um, skin GVHD based on the pathological um, results or the skin biopsy results. So grade zero is normal skin, or they think the changes are related to something other than GVH. Grade one would be vascularization of the basal layer of epidermal and epidermal junction. Grade two, basal layer vascularization. Um, there can also be necrotic epidermal cells and lymphocytic infiltrates. Grade, the, grade three has all of the grade two features plus cleft formation at the dermal epidermal junction. In grade four, um, they can see all the grade two changes plus separation of the epidermis from the dermis, which is where you get the slothing of the skin. Some things to consider for differential diagnosis in patients that we may think have acute GVHD. Um, so we can see rashes from drug eruptions. Our patients are on a multitude of medications post-transplant. Um, we can see viral exanthems that cause rash. Um, a lot of our patients have um, suppressed immune systems, so they can reactivate a lot of viruses. Eruption of lymphocyte recovery um, as patients are recovering their cells post-transplant. Acral erythema, um, that's where patients get um, erythema on their palms and soles, which can be a chemo effect. Toxic epidermal necrolysis, which is like Steven Johnson syndrome, usually medication-induced. Um, engraftment syndrome, which we typically see more with autos than with allos. Um, radiation dermatitis or erythema multiform. The treatment for acute skin GVHD. Um, so with any GVHD, the best thing is going to be to optimize prophylaxis regimens, which we will talk about in a little bit. But for skin GVHD, we can often treat with just topical steroids um, if it's a low grade. We use different ones, so options are triamcinolone, clobetazole, um, desinide, or hydrocortisone. This is usually used for grade one cutaneous GVHD. Um, there are options if patients still have low grade GVHD in their refractory to topical steroids. There mm -hmm. is a topical tacrolimus or um, ruxolitinib, which we'll talk a bit about a little bit later on. If patients have higher grade uh, skin GVH, though, the topical steroids don't typically um, help as much because it's hard to put um, steroid creams or ointments all over your body. So then we look at systemic steroids, um, prednisone or methylprednisolone. Um, usually we can get by with just oral prednisone in our patients unless they have that severe grade four skin GVHD. Um, so systemic steroids are usually given for grade two or higher, um, and our dosing is usually one to two milligrams per kilogram. So our first question for Pull Everywhere, um, we have a patient that's 87 days post-transplant. Um, they got a match-related stem cell transplant. 
They present to clinic with a macular papular rash covering 20% of their body surface area, and they experienced sunburn one week ago. The current medications are Baltrex, Bactrim, Norbask, and Lorazepam. And what is the most likely etiology of the rash? Uh, drug allergy to Bactrim, B, acute GVHD, C, persistent sunburn effect, or D, chronic GVHD. So it looks like most people are getting it right. So B, acute GVHD. So next we'll talk about uh, acute GI GVHD. Um, often this can involve the upper and lower GI tract. So with lower GI, we can see diarrhea and abdominal pain. Upper GI, we can see nausea, vomiting, and anorexia. Um, diagnosis can be made clinically, but often is confirmed by pathological evaluation. Um, so an EGD, flex sig, or colonoscopy. Um, there's also a clinical grading for GI GBH, um, and it's based on the volume of diarrhea. So stage one is 500 to 1,000 mLs a day. Stage two would be a liter to a liter and a half of diarrhea. Stage three, one and a half to two liters. And stage four is greater than two liters or significant abdominal pain or ileus. With the histological diagnosis, so on endoscopy or colonoscopy, they may see spotted erythema, aphthous lesions, or denuded mucosa. Um, but the absence of these um, visualizations or visually normal mucosa doesn't eliminate the potential um, to have uh, a burrow or GI GBH. And then a rectal biopsy can be done as well, which can so show crypt cell necrosis um, with accumulation of degenerative material in the dead crypts. And there can also be denuded um, or total loss of epithelium in this in severe disease. Differential for GI GVHD um, would be chemo-induced nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, C. diff or other GI pathogens, viral CMV, and this can actually clinically and histologically look very similar to acute GVHD. Um, so it's recommended that staining for CMV pathogens is done um, if a biopsy is obtained. HSV or candida esophagitis, gastritis, or peptic ulcers. The treatment for GI GVHD is going to be steroids. Um, typically, we would do one to two mg per kg, um, and a lot of times we have to do IV formulation for this um, just because they don't absorb the oral as well. Um, also, supportive care is going to be important, so fluids, patients can easily get dehydrated um, with their symptoms. In blood products, patients can have um, blood with their diarrhea, and so they may need transfusions. Bowel rest is helpful to allow the gut to heal, and then pain management if they are having abdominal pain, with the caveat to monitor for an ileus. Acute liver GDHD um, typically presents in patients that also have cutaneous or GI GVHD, but can present alone. Um, signs and symptoms, transaminitis, typically ALKFOS, um, but we can also see ALT or AST elevated as well. Hyperbilirubinemia, hepatomegaly, dark urine, pale stool, fluid retention, or pruritus. The grading is based on bilirubin. So stage one would be a bili of two to three. Stage two would be a bili of three to six. Stage three, bili of six to 15. And stage four, a bili greater than 15. Acute liver GVHD, some of the things to think for for differential. Um, hepatic veno-occlusive disease is a complication we can see post-transplant where there's obstruction of the veins of the liver. Um, and hepatic infection, hepatitis, um, chemo effects, as well as drug toxicity, um, especially some of the azoles. There are other um, GVHD manifestations that it can occur with acute GVHD. So skin, liver, and GI tract are the principal target organs with acute GVHD. And less commonly, we can see involvement of the hematopoietic system, the eyes, kidneys, and lungs. However, changes in these other organ systems cannot be used to establish the diagnosis of acute GVHD. They typically have to be diagnosed based on skin, liver, or GI tract involvement. So other manifestations, with hematopoietic involvement, um, this can result in thymic atrophy, cytopenias, especially the th um, platelet, so thrombocytopenia, and then hypogammaglobinemia, um, especially IgA deficiency. There can be ocular involvement, um, which can result in photophobia, 
hemorrhagic conjunctivitis and the inability to shut the eyes completely. Uh, renal involvement can manifest as nephritis or nephrotic syndrome and lung involvement can manifest as interstitial pneumonitis. So um, each organ system is graded, um, but then there's also a severity grade we can give based on um, the different organs that are involved. And there's two ways to grade this. So the Glucksberg grading, um, a grade one would be stage one or two skin with no liver or gut involvement. Grade two would be stage one to three skin involvement or grade one liver or gut. Stage two, or uh, grade three would be stage two or three skin, liver or gut involvement. And grade four would be stage one to four of skin or stage two to four liver or gut involvement. And then the CIBMTR also has a severity index. Um, so grade A or level A would be stage one skin involvement with no liver or gut. Um, B would be stage two skin involvement with stage one or two of the gut. Uh, C would be stage three skin, liver, or gut, and D would be stage four skin, liver, or gut. So our next question, um, a prior patient that had a rash on 20% of their body surface area, which was consistent with acute GVHD, now presents 10 days later, so day seven, 97, post-transplant, and they have a worsening rash. It's now covering 40% of their body surface area. So what grade of skin GVHD does this patient have? Uh, grade zero, grade one, grade two, or grade three? So it looks like most people got it correct. Um, oh, more coming in. So grade two, so that's that 25 to 50% body surface area. So one of the most important ways we can um, try to help with GVHD post-transplant is using GVHD prophylaxis in our patients. So prophylactic strategies focus on T-cell suppression in the recipient. And the mainstay of GVHD prophylaxis is going to be calcineurin inhibitor plus an anti-metabolite. Mm -hmm. um, and the suggestion of using these combinations is based on superior survival and less acute GVHD with the combination compared with either agent alone. So calcineurin inhibitors, um, they inhibit the proliferation and activation of T cells. Um, this includes tacrolimus and cyclosporin. Um, Antimetabolites include methotrexate, which attenuates the T cell activation at low non-cytotoxic doses, and mycophenolate or MMF, which is a prodrug of the immunosuppressant mycophenolic acid. And this has a potent cytotox cytostatic effect on lymphocytes. So, um, Kind of looking at why do we use calcineurin inhibitors plus methotrexate or MMF. So a calcineurin inhibitor plus an anti-metabolite is superior to a calcineurin inhibitor alone. There was a phase three trial from 1986 that compared cyclosporin to cyclosporin plus methotrexate, and they reported um, overall survival was higher and the incidence of acute GVHD was lower with cyclosporin plus methotrexate compared to cyclosporin alone. And then calcineurin inhibitor plus anti-metabolite is superior to an anti-metabolite alone. There was a randomized trial that compared cyclosporin plus methotrexate versus methotrexate alone. And this showed that cyclosporin plus methotrexate had improved two-year overall survival compared to methotrexate alone and less grade two to four acute GPHD with cyclosporin plus methotrexate versus methotrexate alone. Um, and then looking at methotrexate versus mycophenolate, um, there's a single center phase two randomized trial that compared TAC methotrexate to TAC MMF. And it showed that TAC and metho with methotrexate was more effective in preventing severe acute GVHD. And then a CIBMTR study um, showed significantly inferior GVHD in survival outcomes with cyclosporin plus MMF compared to TAC with methotrexate, cyclosporin with methotrexate and TAC with MMF and myeloablative transplants, and this suggested an advantage of methotrexate over MMF for GVHD prevention. There is another option for prophylaxis, um, especially in patients that do not tolerate tacrolimus. Um, there's a medication called serolimus or rapamune, and this is the first commercially available mTOR, um, which is a um, mechanistic target of, of rapamycin, um, and this um, medication helps to suppress cytokine-driven cell growth and proliferation. 
which blocks the co-stimulatory signals. The typical starting dose, um, we do a 12 milligram load times one followed by four milligrams daily. And then we have target levels um, for this as well as TAC, which we'll go over in a bit. Um, target level for serolimus is three to 12. And then the dose adjust is um, adjusted based on these levels. There are toxicities with serolimus, so there's increased risk of SOS or that VOD when used with calcineurin inhibitors or methotrexate, or when used following ablative doses of busulfam. And then there's increased risk of MAHA, which is microangiopathic hemolytic anemia um, when used with combination of calcineurin inhibitors. Another option for prophylaxis is post-transplant cyclophosphamide. Um, so cyclophosphamide has a potent and selective activity against alloreactive donor T cells, which results in low incidences of GVHD and transplant-related mortality. And this has actually allowed us to perform um, transplants that are HLA mismatched. There is a trial, um, the PROGRESS-1 trial, which was a BMCTN trial that evaluated novel approaches mm -hmm. for GVHD prevention using reduced intensity um, conditioning therapies. So post-transplant psi plus TAC plus MMF was associated with lower rates of severe acute GVHD and chronic GVHD requiring immunosuppression without a significant impact on overall survival or relapse when compared with just TAC and methotrexate. Another option for GVHD prophylaxis is um, T cell depletion. And this can be done uh, two ways. So there's in vivo T cell depletion, which is giving ATG. Um, there's rabbit or horse ATG. And these are polyclonal immunoglobulins directed against antigens expressed on the human T lymphocytes or ex vivo T cell depletion, which is removing the T cells from the donor stem cells. Selection of GVHD prophylaxis. So there's lots of options. How do we choose what to use? Um, so there are recommendations based on donor match, um, so related donors, TAC or cyclosporin plus methotrexate, unrelated TAC or cyclosporin plus methotrexate plus or minus ATG, APLOS, TAC or cyclosporin plus methotrexate plus that post-transplant cyclophosphamide, um, and a HAPLO is a half-match transplant. Um, your selection may also be based on your conditioning regimen, so those myeloablatives, um, those higher intensity chemotherapies, um, TAC or cyclosporin plus methotrexate, non myeloblative there's not really a difference um, in TAC or cyclosporin or methotrexate or uh, MMF, but some centers do favor MMF because it's um, in non myeloblative regimens because of less risk of mucositis compared to methotrexate, and there's less um, length of immune suppression or that um, suppression of the counts with mycophenolate compared to methotrexate. And then stem cell source, there's not really a difference. Um, there was no difference in TAC or cyclosporin plus methotrexate or MMF. Um, just the, remembering that peripheral blood has higher risk of GVH in general compared to, to bone marrow. So the, this is a table that kind of just shows some of the options we've gone over um, that we use for prophylaxis and how we give them. Um, a key thing here I'll point out are just the side effects. So ATG can cause fever, rash, hypotension, rigors, flu-like symptoms. Um, and we do give pre-meds to prevent infusion reaction in the formulation, so rabbit or horse are not interchangeable. Uh, methotrexate can cause mucositis that prolong neutropenia or transient hepatotoxicity. And there is a depot effect if they're fluid overloaded um, and increased toxicity with nephrotoxicity. And then calcineurin inhibitors can cause hypertension, elevated blood sugars, uh, nephrotoxicity, neurotoxicity, hyper or hypokalemia, hypomag or tremors. Um, and you have to also watch for significant drug interactions, especially with azoles or clarithromycin. And then we also have here um, with the dosing, so the calcineurin inhibitors that list our goals there. So cyclosporin or trough is 200 to 400 and TAC is five to 10, but that's UNC specific. And then the other thing to point out with methotrexate is for our related transplants, we give methotrexate um, one day, three days, and six days after their stem cell infusion. With the unrelated donor, we add in the extra um, day plus 11 methotrexate. Treatment for acute GVHD. Um, so it really depends on the site of disease and disease severity, um, topical steroids, um, creams and ointments can be used for skin GVH, and then topical agents such as beclomethazone, budesonide, or dexamethasone rinses. 
The next um, mainstay of treatment is gonna be systemic steroids. So one to two mg per kg, um, depending on how high of the dose, you may wanna give it in divided doses rather than just one large dose. And then uh, we try to taper from our starting dose. If it's above one mg per, per kg, we try to taper to that pretty quickly and then slow the taper after that. And then one thing to consider with steroids is the adjustment needed for uh, antimicrobial prophylaxis. So steroids um, work well for treatment um, of GVHD, but unfortunately have a lot of side effects. So we can see steroid-induced hyperglycemia, even if patients didn't have prior diabetes. Um, so we monitor blood sugars and start agents if needed. Um, insomnia, patients may need sleep aids. Um, mood disturbances and psychosis can occur cataracts as well as osteoporosis um, and long-term use steroids. And so DEXA scans are important to obtain as well as starting patients on calcium and vitamin D. Muscle weakness can occur, especially pro proximal muscle weakness. So physical therapy may be important to get um, for patients that have long-term steroid use. And then infection is gonna be the big um, risk factor for our patient. So we do put our patients on infection prevention. Um, so with steroids for antibacterial prophylaxis, we typically use penicillin. Unless the patient is still neutropenic, then we would use Leviquin. Antifungal prophylaxis, so um, posaconazole or voriconazole are preferred over fluconazole. Um, there was a study um, that is from the graph on the right um, that compared posa and fluke for prophylaxis and severe GVHD. And it showed that posaconazole was similar to fluconazole in preventing all fungal infections, but was posaconazole was superior to fluconazole in preventing invasive fungal infections like aspergillus. And then this uh, graph shows that the posaconazole had a lower probability of onset of infection compared to fluconazole. And posaconazole results in fewer fungal infection related deaths um, and those being treated for GVHD versus fluconazole. For PJP prophylaxis, um, Bactrim, Pentamidine, Dapsone, or Atovaquone are used, and then shingle prevention, Valtrex is used. We also recommend infection monitoring, so weekly monitoring for viral reactivation of CNV. Um, if patients received ATG, we also recommend monitoring for EBV. We don't typically monitor for other um, viruses routinely, but if patients are starting to have declining counts or other concerns for um, viral infection, we can check other viruses. Um, and then one virus we can see is BK. So if patients present with hematuria, plus or minus clots, um, dysuria, bladder spasms, we check a urine and serum BK. Um, and there's not a great treatment for this. Um, hydration is the best option to help kind of flush out that virus. But uh, patients can get um, continuous bladder irrigation or intravesicular sidopavir if they have severe symptoms. So our next question, um, going back to the same patient, um, they had grade two acute skin GVHD with rash on 40% of body surface area. They were treated with triamcinolone cream three times a day for a week, and they had no improvement in their rash. So we decided to start prednisone one mg per kg, which is 40 milligrams a day. Um, the patient's not neutropenic neutropenic and already taking Profi, Valtrex, and Bactrim, what other medications should you start? So for this patient, looks like there's some still rolling in. Um, the correct answer is D. So we choose penicillin because the patient's not neutropenic and then posaconazole is the preferred over fluconazole. So what do we do in steroid refractory disease? So 30 to 50% of um, GVH patients fail to improve after five days or have worsening symptoms within 72 hours of starting steroids. There can also be an inability to taper steroids without a significant disease flare. There are lots of different options that have now come out um, for these patients. There's ruxolitinib, ECP therapy, infliximab, basiliximab, TOSI, um, MMF, Rituxx, and Ciro. We'll talk about a lot of these in a little bit. And then visceral disease typically be, seems to be more refractory than skin. Um, so acute GVHD is a common complication 
participation of allotransplants recipients with unrelated mismatched peripheral donors are at highest risk. Um, it commonly affects the skin, GI tract, and liver. Calcineurin inhibitors, methotrexate, and the MAF post-transplant psi and ATG are all commonly used to prevent GDH, and the first-line treatment is typically high-dose steroids. So now we'll talk a little bit on chronic GVHD. Again, typically after 100 days. Um, more recently, they have looked at chronic GVHD as defined by diagnostic and descriptive um, symptoms or features. Um, so chronic GVHD is a different effector cell than acute GVHD, so it has different clinical manifestations, which is why they can um, have specific features based on G uh, chronic GVHD. So this is that same table from before, um, but now looking at chronic GVHD, um, classic is going to have no time limit, so it can be before or after 100 days, has no acute features, but has chronic features, and then overlap syndrome, again, no time limit, um, but has chronic and acute features. So chronic GVHD is a syndrome of variable clinical features that resemble autoimmune and other immunologic disorders, such as scleroderma, Sjogren's, primary biliary cirrhosis, bronchiolitis obliterans. Clinical manifestations may be widespread or they may be restricted to a single organ or site, and it can be a major cause of morbidity and mortality after transplant. Um, patients often have impaired physical, social, psychological, and well-being, um, and impaired quality of life. Risk factors. So the biggest risk factor for the development of chronic GVHD is actually prior acute GVHD. So the higher the grade of prior acute GVHD, the higher the incidence we can see chronic GVHD. Risk factor, other risk factors. Um, so again, HLA disparity. So an HLA mismatched unrelated donor is 1.57 times more likely to have G chronic GVH versus a matched related donor. Age of the donor um, or recipient, again, older ages are higher risk. Ses sex mix mismatches, um, graft source, so peripheral blood is um, a higher risk than bone marrow. And then recipients of DOI, which are donor lymphocyte infusions. <clears throat> so chronic GVHD resembles acute states, but with chronic inflammation. So looking at acute skin, we saw rash, erythema, paritis, and exfoliation. But in chronic, we can see sclerodermatous changes, decreased elasticity. Um, with gut, with acute, it was diarrhea. With chronic, we can see malabsorption, weight loss, strictures, and stenosis. Um, eyes, lungs, and joints minimally are involved for acute, but are frequently involved for chronic. Um, so dry eye, decreased joint capacity, contractions of joints as well. So chronic GVHD, um, for each involved organ system, there may be diagnostic features, um, which can be used to sufficiently diagnose, distinctive features, which alone are not sufficient to diagnose, or common features, which can be seen in chronic or acute. Um, with skin, nails, and hair, so there's a list of diagnostic features for skin, um, things like lichen planus features, sclerotic features, or lichen sclerosis. Um, distinctive would be depigmentation. Common between acute and chronic are going to be erythema, macular papular rash, and pruritus. Nails have no diagnostic, but distinctive would be dystrophy, longitudinal ridging, onchoiasis, nail loss, mm -hmm. um, and hair as well does not have Diagnostic, but distinctive, would be new onset alopecia, scaling, papulosquamous lesions. This is a picture of a patient with chronic GVHD. Um, they have some violaceous papules and plaques, um, and they have many areas with reticulated appearance as well. Um, and this is on their skin and or arms and trunk. Um, this is a picture of dystrophic nails, which can be a sign of chronic GVHD. Um, this is actually called the prayer sign. So the patient has um, contractures and um, scarring or kind of thickening of the um, skin or joints and fascia. And so they're unable to actually extend their fingers, but the overlying skin itself looks normal. With mouth GVHD, um, there are diagnostic features, lichen type features, hyperkeratotic plaques, or the restriction of mouth opening due to sclerosis. Um, so distinctive features, serostomia, mucoceles, atrophy, ulcers, and then common gingivitis, mucositis, erythema, or pain. Eyes have no um, diagnostic features, but distinctive new onset dry, gritty, or painful eyes, um, citrical conjunctivitis, keratoconjunctivitis, or punctate keratopathy. 
uh, genitalia have no diagnostic feature, or sorry, diagnostic features would be lichen planus or vaginal scarring or stenosis, and distinctive would be erosions, fissures, or ulcers. Chronic GI, uh, GBH diagnostic would be esophageal webs, strictures, or stenosis in the upper to mid third of the esophagus, um, but there are no distinctive features. And then lung diagnostic is bronchiolitis obliterans diagnosed by lung biopsy, whereas distinctive would be bronchiolitis obliterans diagnosed with pulmonary function tests and radiology. Muscles, fascia, and joints diagnostic are going to be fasciitis, joint stiffness or contractures um, due to the sclerosis. Distinctive would be myositis or polymyositis. Liver actually doesn't have diagnostic or distinctive features, but there are common features um, for acute and chronic abnormal LFTs greater than two times the upper limit of normal. Typically, bilirubin, outfoss, and ALT are elevated. And if you have a patient that you suspect isolated hepatic um, chronic GVHD and they have no other diagnostic features of any other chronic GVHD in other organs, then a liver biopsy should be performed for diagnosis. Some common features, so mouth, um, gingivitis, mucositis, erythema, and pain are common to both chronic and acute. And then GI tract, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, malabsorption, weight loss, and failure to thrive in children are common to both chronic and acute. There is a grading or severity for chronic similar to acute, um, but it can be difficult to determine because of the wide range of affected organs and different presentations. So this uh, chart just goes through, there's a mild, moderate, and severe. So treatment for chronic GVHD. Um, the long-term goal of therapy is for patients to develop immune tolerance and decrease their morbidity. And then we recognize that this goal is reached when we're able to taper, immun taper immunosuppressive agents without a flare of their GVH symptoms. So there's a lot of different options for treatment for chronic GVHD. Um, initial treatment is going to depend on site and severity. Again, steroids are going to be the mainstay of treatment. Um, typically, we do a lower dose starting, so 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg per day. We tend to keep them at this dose for one to two weeks and then taper by 10 to 15% every 10 to 14 days. Um, but only about 50% of patients have a treatment response. So that means 50% of patients will require an alternative treatment within two years. And then less than 20% of patients are alive and without disability at four years. So abrutinib is another option. This inhibits B cell and cytokine receptor pathways. It was FDA approved in 2017 for chronic GVHD. The dosing is 420 milligrams daily. And toxicities include fatigue, nausea, diarrhea, muscle spasms, bruising, and pneumonia. Um, there was a clinical trial that showed um, abrutinib was clinically meaningful and had sustained response in patients who have failed more than one prior treatment for chronic GVHD with an overall response rate of 67%. 71% had a sustained response of greater than 20 weeks, and there was a similar response rate across all affected organs. And then patients experienced reductions in steroid doses while receiving abrutinib. Ruxolitinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor and it inhibits JAK1 and 2. It was approved in 2021 for chronic GVHD. Dosing um, is 10 milligrams twice a day. Toxicities include cytopenia, CMV reactivation, and hyperlipidemia. The REACH3 study um, looked at the overall response rate at week 24 in patients with steroid refractory chronic GVHD. Um, and the Ruxolitinib group had a 49% overall response rate. Um, compared to 25% in the group that received um, the best alternative treatment. Um, extracorporal photophoresis, or ECP, is widely used in mucocutaneous chronic GVHD as a second-line therapy, especially for steroid refractory patients. Um, it's effective in up to 80% of patients. It's typically paired sessions every two weeks, and there's a reassessment at three months. Um, it takes advantage of the ability to sensitize and alter the functionality of T cells, it's um, using photosensitizing agents, um, then followed by UVA exposure, and it allow, allows for intercalation of the lymphocyte DNA, which then leads to apoptosis of the, the lymphocytes. So the process, blood's taken um, from a line, it's run through a cell separator, T cells are removed, and the remaining blood is returned. Then the lymphocytes are mixed with photosensitizing agents. They're exposed to UVA light, which activates these agents. 
and then they can intercalate lymphocyte DNA and induce apoptosis. And then the lymphocytes are then reinfused back into the body. This is just a picture kind of showing that process. And then the use of ECP has been shown to be partic particularly useful in patients with steroid refractory cutaneous acute or chronic GVHD. Um, and it can be used as a steroid sparing option. And then treatments are usually done initially weekly, then decreased every two weeks um, as patients tolerate it. So summary for a chronic GVHD, um, it represents a significant unmet need for patients undergoing allogeneic stem cell transplant is a, is a leading cause of non-relapse mortality. It mimics autoimmune and immunologic diseases. Um, steroids, again, are the main uh, therapy, but there are treatment options for steroid refractory, such as abrutinib, ruxolitinib, and ECP. And then there are cl current clinical trials um, aiming to better define chronic GVHD as well as assess for different treatment options. And then there is a bright side um, to graft host disease. So it does have some benefit that immune response that we're seeing that are attacking the normal healthy Host cells are also destroying surviving cancer cells. So there's a graft versus tumor or leukemic effect. And this can also lead to lower um, relapse rates. So we do tell our patients a little bit of GBHD is not a bad thing. Questions? So thank you, Megan, lots of information. So um, if you have questions for Megan, you can submit them through Poll Everywhere. Um, through the website, through your phone, um, through the app on your iPhone or Android. So I, I will leave questions to more people who are, are managing these complications. Um, I have way back in the day, but certainly not recently. Questions, anyone? All right, Megan, it doesn't look like there are questions coming through, um, except for right now. Um, are there <laughs> any side effects to the UVA treatment? Um, so not necessarily side effects, but I do know a limiting factor for a lot of patients is just the time constraint for it. Um, a lot of these patients that get this chronic GVHD are kind of later on in their course, they've already transitioned back home and having to come back here twice a week for several weeks to get this therapy can be very difficult um, timing wise, but also transportation wise, financial wise. Um, so there can be limitations with it. Well, thank you. Um, we have another one coming in. For ECP, I seem to have here that T cells are separated, but the diagram indicated leukocytes. Are all leukocytes treated? Um, so it should be, yeah. So the diagram has the leukocytes. So it's the lymphocytes that we take out and treat with the photosensitizing agents. And that wraps up any questions. So thank you, Megan, for sharing your expertise. Um, um, Megan's lecture will be online in about a week. You'll be able to um, review and share with your colleagues um, to go back and um, uh, find out any information. So thank you all for your attendance. Um, this afternoon, and thank you to the University Cancer Research Fund, to UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, and the Lineberger Cancer Network. Our telehealth team are rock stars in the background making all this happen. So thank you to Tim Poe, Benny Abiori, John Powell, Oliver Marth, Andrew Dodson, Nadja Brown, and Patrick Muscarella.